Let me welcome all of you today to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Fred Bergston, uh, director for a long time, director emeritus and senior fellow now, uh, standing in for Adam Posen, who's on the road today. Um, this is a great event because we look forward to the release of a new poll by the uh, Pew Research Center, which is really pathbreaking on the issues of globalization, international trade, and investment. Um, as you will hear, it's a survey that was conducted across 48,000 people in 44 countries asking six questions about international trade, investment, and globalization. So think of it as a six by 44 or even six by 48,000 matrix, which generates an enormous amount of data. Uh, it is thought the most extensive ever done to try to gauge public opinion around the world on this set of questions that we, of course, devote ourselves here to at the Institute and for which we think Pew has done an enormous service by trying to gauge where attitudes stand as big trade negotiations, global cooperation efforts, and the like proceed. Obviously, got to be based on public support and attitudes, and this tries to assess those in the most comprehensive way we think has ever been done and for the first time. So it's a great pleasure to be able to host this discussion, um, uh, elaboration of the Pew research results and elaboration of them. The report will be presented to us by Bruce Stokes. Uh, Bruce is the director of Global Economic Attitudes in the Pew Research Center's Global Attitudes Project, where they are all the time assessing views around the world on key topics. Here they do it on globalization. Bruce, of course, used to be the international economics correspondent for the National Journal. He was a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund at the Council on Foreign Relations and is one of the most experienced journalists, analysts, and now assessors of international attitudes on these questions. Bruce is going to bring us uh, a summary of the new survey and what it means, we think, for policy around the world on the whole set of international trade and investment issues. We then will have three commentators to convey views from different perspectives and set the stage for the broader discussion. Um, the first of our commentators is uh, uh, Duncan Campbell. Duncan is the Deputy Director of Research at the International Labor Office. We involve the ILO because, of course, attitudes of workers around the world are key on these questions, and he assesses that from an ILO standpoint. Uh, Duncan is the director of the Global Megatrends team at the ILO uh, in its uh, directorate of research. Uh, he joined the ILO back in 1990 from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's worked extensively in South and Southeast Asia, was based in the ILO's Bangkok office for four years, has a wealth of experience on international labor markets. Our second commentator to turn to the U.S. labor side is Thea Lee. Uh, Thea is now Deputy Chief of Staff at the AFL-CIO. She had previously been Policy Director there, Chief International Economist. Um, many of you know her as a frequent uh, uh, analyst and commentator on global trade issues uh, and investment issues for a long time from the perspective of the U.S. Uh, labor force. She'd worked at the Economic Policy Institute in an earlier incarnation and I think it's fair to say is a fixture in the U.S. trade community here in Washington. Our cleanup hitter then is Ambassador Susan Schwab. Uh, Susan is now strategic advisor at Mayor Brown. She was, of course, U.S. trade representative from 2006 to 2009, where, among other things, she launched the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's sometimes forgotten, but uh, in fact, that's uh, when the U.S. engagement in that current mega negotiation was launched. She did lots of other things as well, uh, bringing Chorus to its final conclusion uh, and several other FTAs, which have now been implemented and are a lasting legacy to her. Uh, she had previously been Director General of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service at the Commerce Department. She was a senior aide to Senator Jack Danforth for many years uh, when he was the, the leader of the uh, Republican side of the Senate on trade issues. Uh, 
back in days when there was a bit more comity and cooperation on those issues than we see today. Susan also has extensive experience in the private sector uh, in different capacities at Motorola, at Boeing, at FedEx, at Caterpillar, being on the boards of several of those companies. And she served as dean of the School of Public Affairs at the University of Maryland for an extended period as well, where she is now, in fact, a professor in the School of Public Policy. So the lineup, I think, is um, uh, suggesting a series of quite interesting views and different perspectives. I'll ask Bruce to start it off. Each of the discussants will then give their remarks from here. The whole group will then uh, take seats at the table to open up discussion with the audience, which we hope we'll have uh, plenty of time for after the initial presentation. Bruce, start us off. Thank you, Fred. Uh, it's a real honor and a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, as I look across uh, the audience here, I see a lot of uh, old friends, uh, mentors, uh, sources. So I certainly do look forward to your comments, uh, questions about this data. Uh, as Fred said, it is, uh, we think, an unprecedented uh, global survey of uh, people's uh, values and attitudes surrounding, around trade. I would like to thank the Peterson Institute for inviting us. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a sign of the kind of collegiality between think tanks that uh, is really a, a, a credit to Peterson. Uh, we're very happy to be uh, uh, hosted here by them and, and very appreciative. I'd like to thank Adam Posen for inviting us. Um, and um, Fred, I'd like to thank you uh, for uh, all that I've learned from you over the years and all your, from all your colleagues in terms of the debate, the ongoing debate in this country about, about globalization. Um, I can't um, uh, not share with you a, an anecdote. I vividly remember when um, Fred took me out to lunch in about 1980 to tell me, he was at Brookings at the time or Carnegie, I forget where, to, to tell me about this new institute he was going to be uh, founding. And I must say that my only advice was serve good lunches. Uh, so to the extent that you've uh, had a great meal at the, uh, um, on, on the Peterson Institute for all of these years, uh, you have me to thank. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the broad takeaway from this survey is that um, publics around the world are basically free traders in principle, and they are, and many of them, especially in advanced economies, are protectionists uh, in practice. Uh, which, and I don't mean protectionist in a, a pejorative sense. I mean in the sense that they're worried about the impact of, of trade on their lives. Um, now, especially in advanced economies, uh, uh, these would appear to be seemingly contradictory views. Um, uh, I can tell you that when you work with public opinion research, you find this all the time, uh, that people in principle believe one thing, in practice they believe another. Uh, and I would uh, advise you, those of you who are looking for pure reason and logical thinking in public opinion, uh, you need to get over it. This is not <laughs> the way public opinion works. Um, the reality is that people are infinitely capable of holding mutually contradictory emotions at the same time. Um, and policymakers, pollsters, um, politicians, journalists, and I would say for those of you who are economists, especially economists who are overly rational, uh, you just have to learn to live with that complexity. Uh, people um, uh, do not uh, necessarily see that these views are contradictory. We are looking for emotion. We are looking for people's sense of an issue. Uh, these, are, these are surveys of average people. They haven't thought about these things a lot. They haven't studied them. We're asking them for their emotion. Um, I think we can also broadly derive from the survey that people all over the world accept that globalization is here to stay. They think it would be good for their societies. And people in emerging and developing countries think that it creates jobs and it raises wages. Um, but people in advanced economies, as I said, uh, aren't so sure about that. And they have their doubts. Um, 
if I could uh, go to the tape, as they say. Um, first off, just a little bit about the Pew Research Center. Uh, we are largely funded by the Pew Charitable Trust. God bless them. Uh, they're based in Philadelphia, a big American foundation. Uh, we're nonprofit, nonpartisan, non advocacy. So we uh, do research, but we do not advocate policies. Uh, and we do research on a range of issues domestic politics, religion, the internet, Hispanics in America. Uh, we've surveyed on the global side of this, uh, uh, of our operation, since uh, 2002 when I helped design the first Pew Global Attitude Survey. Uh, we've now surveyed in 82 countries. All of this data is available on the website. It's free. It's searchable, which is, I think is the most important issue. If you ever have a question about public opinion, you can go and type in your question and see if we've ever actually surveyed upon it. Um, this particular survey was done this year in 44 countries. As Fred said, 48,000 respondents uh, in March to June, depending on the country. As you can well imagine, places like India can take six to eight weeks to survey because in developing countries, these are face-to-face -face interviews. And they are representative of the entire population. So you send people out to rural Rajasthan to interview people. Um, in advanced economies, mostly, mostly in Europe, the US, Japan, Korea, we do this by telephone. Uh, margin of error is about 3 to 4%. Um, these are the countries we surveyed this year. Uh, we would survey more in Africa, but uh, it's a very difficult to survey in Africa. We'll be doing more next year. Um, general overview, as you can see, basically, publics, the median for these 44 countries, the people basically say trade's good for the country, and they, and they like the fact that foreigners want to come and build plants in their uh, uh, country and create jobs where jobs didn't exist before. But when you get into some of these other issues, the median begins to go down in terms of, of whether trade creates jobs, whether it raises wages, uh, whether foreign companies buying domestic companies is actually that good of a thing. Uh, and I might point out, as you can see, basically nobody believes that trade lowers prices. Um, we uh, tried to analyze these, uh, this data uh, by grouping countries in advanced, emerging, and developing countries to see if that paradigm might give us some insight into the data. As you can see, there's almost no difference in the classification between uh, countries' uh, view that trade's good for the economy. But you begin to get down here into whether trade raises wages. As you can see, people in advanced economies, only 25% say that trade raises wages, whereas uh, people in uh, developing countries, 55% say that uh, trade uh, raises wages. Uh, by the way, these, this advanced emerging developing uh, di division uh, is based on IMF and World Bank categories with some, some tweaking. Um, we have been uh, consistently asking whether trade is good for your country. Uh, in 15 countries, so we were able to give uh, uh, trend data on that question. As you can see, three quarters of the public uh, in those countries say that trade's good for the country. Uh, in the U.S., we're less supportive of trade. Now, two-thirds of Americans still say that trade's good for the country, so that's not too shabby. But the point is it is less than um, uh, the, the global median. Uh, and as you can see, here are some crucial questions about whether trade creates jobs, whether it raises wages, whether foreign-led M&A is a good thing. Um, and here's where Americans uh, compare in terms of the rest of the world. So that's the U.S. versus 43 other countries. As you can see, we come in pretty low on those, uh, by those measures. Um, because we are engaged in two unprecedented uh, trade uh, negotiations, uh, I thought it would be useful to compare uh, the results in the U.S. and some of the other key negotiating countries with the other countries involved in these negotiations. So you look at the U.S., and this is on just one issue, on, on, on does trade create jobs. Only 20 percent of Americans believe that trade creates jobs, whereas the uh, median in other TPP countries is 55% and 50% in other TTIP countries. So you can see that there are a number of outlier countries in these negotiations that are really below the median. Uh, 
And they happen to be some of the most important countries in that negotiation. Certainly Japan and the US are the key uh, partners in the TPP negotiations. And uh, I think it probably comes as no surprise that the French are going to be a problem in the TTIP uh, negotiation. Uh, to give you a broad overview, uh, we ask people about whether trade creates jobs. As you can see, basically, uh, in developing countries, two-thirds of people in developing countries say that trade creates jobs. Uh, but less than half in advanced uh, uh, countries say that trade uh, creates jobs. Um, it's still more than, say, uh, that it leads to job losses, but uh, it's, it's, it is less than half. And uh, advanced, people in advanced economies are less likely to say trade creates jobs than uh, people in emerging or, or developing countries. Um, if you look at uh, the countries where uh, people are most likely to say trade destroys jobs, uh, what jumps out at you is they are all advanced economies except Colombia. Um, and uh, uh, half of Americans say uh, trade destroys jobs, um, as do nearly half the French uh, and more than a third of the Japanese. Um, but you should also notice that there's a, a fairly substantial, about a quarter of the population, sometimes comes countries even higher, they say it makes no difference. So while we've asked people a direct question, we did give them the option of saying, look, I don't see a connection here. Now, what you probably get there is, I don't see a connection or I don't know. So it's probably a, a, both of those. Um, um, we ask people if trade increases wages. Again, people in developing countries are much more likely to say that trade increases wages than people in advanced economies, where you can see that only 25% uh, say that trade uh, increases wages. Um, the countries where you're most likely to see trade, uh, where people think that trade actually lowers wages, again, are for the most part advanced economies. Um, uh, again, Italy, Greece, France, the US lead the uh, list. Uh, frankly, I don't find this that surprising. Uh, if you look at wage growth in the United States over uh, the last generation or more, it's been stagnating or, or declining. Um, so why in the world would a large portion of Americans say, oh, trade leads to higher uh, wages, uh, when in fact they know that the economy is more open than it was before, and in fact they know that their wages have stagnated or, or declined. Um, I do think it's interesting that nearly a third of Germans also think that trade uh, lowers wages. Um, now, Economics 1 and 1 would tell us that you put more laborers in the global labor market, you're going to have a depressing effect on wages. So again, it's, it's not necessarily uh, illogical for people to, to have this response. And again, it's, I, would, I would underscore, it's not that people know specifically what the GDP per capita wage growth has been in their lifetime. It is that uh, they know what their own experience has been or the experience of their loved ones, and I think that's what they uh, are, are reflecting here. Uh, we ask people, does trade uh, lead to higher prices or lower prices? I would point out to you that Economics 101 tells us that uh, one of the principal reasons countries should trade is because it'll be lower, main lower prices for their consumers. Um, only 35% uh, of people in advanced economies believe that. Um, and well, actually, only 28% believe that it'll decrease prices. 35% think it actually increases prices. But look at this: 50% of people in developing countries think trade leads to higher prices. Frankly, I can't explain that. Uh, it may well be that people know when they go into their store in their local neighborhood, if there is something that's been imported, it's pretty high priced, and that may be what how they make the connection. Um, I would suggest to you, possibly in more advanced societies, it could be that people don't believe that the trickle down from opening the economy is actually reaching them to the extent they would, they, uh, that maybe economic models would suggest it might. Um, we ask a series of questions about, two questions about uh, attitudes towards foreign investment. We had asked in the past, uh, do you think foreign investment is good for your country? And overwhelmingly, people everywhere said yes. So we decided that was not a useful question to ask. Let's ask a more differentiated question. What about 
greenfield investment when a foreigner comes and builds a plant in your country compared to when a foreigner comes and buys a domestic uh, company. And uh, it would come as no surprise, I think, given the kind of tussles we have over foreign investment, especially in Europe and the United States, that um, people in advanced economies basically don't like the idea that foreigners might come and buy their companies. But people overwhelmingly in all uh, economies tend to like the idea of a foreigner coming and building a plant, creating jobs where they didn't exist before. Um, I find it interesting, though, to look at where is the greatest opposition to foreign-led M&A. And what is interesting and what jumps out at you is it's Japan and Germany, uh, which it seems to me may speak to the insular nature of their business cultures. Um, uh, it also may speak to the fact that a couple of years ago, we asked people all over the world about American-style business practices, and two-thirds of the Germans and half the Japanese said they didn't like American-style business practices. So what you don't know, and this is one of the limitations of survey research, you don't know what people are thinking when you ask them this question. Were they thinking, oh, if a foreigner comes and buys a, domestic, a German company, or a it's going to be an American probably, and we don't really like American-style business practices. Again, it's, I think it's cultural. It's not economic, uh, which makes it probably more difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, but look, uh, two-thirds of Americans don't like the idea of foreigners coming and buying American companies. So I think one of the takeaways from this is if you're planning to do foreign investment, build a plant, don't buy a company, uh, because you're more, less likely to face opposition. Uh, I wanted to break out for you some of the specific American views uh, demographically. As you can see, uh, Basically, there's no real opposition to trade in principle among any of the major uh, demographic groups, uh, gender, age, education, income. Um, and while there's more worry that trade decreases wages, uh, it's still less than half in every category, and there's no real demographic split on that issue. Uh, you do begin to see it on whether trade destroys jobs. You can see that. Um, uh, women are more likely to say that trade destroys jobs than men. Uh, older people are more likely to say that trade destroys jobs than younger people. People who are less educated are more likely to say that people are more educated. Lower income people. It is what you would expect, I think, if you thought about it. Uh, what is interesting, it seems to me, is the gender break. You don't see this everywhere. You don't see it in every country. But you do see it in a number of countries where women I would say, are probably more risk adverse. And if you think about trade, if you think about globalization, it is increasing the pace of change in societies. And that's creating more risk. And um, I can't say this from our surveys, but I know in talking to other surveys, actually some people have done some surveys for the AFL-CIO, say they think that in many cases, it is the woman in the family who has to worry about how we're going to feed the kids. And so the change is. Um, uh, maybe more threatening uh, to women than men, at least in the U.S. and a couple of other societies. Uh, not much difference over whether trade increases prices. Um, uh, not a whole lot of difference on, um, in terms of opposition to foreign-led M&A, uh, although older people are more opposed than younger people. Um, and upper in, it's interesting, upper-income people are more opposed than lower-income. Lower income. Now, they both support it. They're both opposed to it. But, but it, I, and I, again, I can't explain that. Um, and there's not uh, much uh, opposition to uh, uh, greenfield investment, and there's certainly no real demographic differences there. Uh, there's actually a very limited partisan split on these questions uh, in the United States. Uh, there are a couple of things that jump out. Um, uh, Democrats are... Um, uh, more likely to say that trade decreases wages than Republicans, although uh, that's not much, I don't, that's not even a statistically significant difference. Um, similarly, Republicans are a little more likely to say that tr uh, trade destroys jobs than Democrats. It's really not a statistically significant difference. Um, there is a, a bigger difference here in terms of Republicans being uh, more wary of foreign led MA than Democrats. But again, both are opposed to it. It's just a question that Republicans are slightly more opposed to it. 
But what is striking is there's not much of a, of, a, of a partisan difference here on these sets of issues. You might have expected that. We, I expected it. We didn't find it. Um, we ask these questions, by the way, at least the trade-related questions in 2010, so we went back and looked to see whether there'd been any change. There really hasn't been. Uh, now, I will warn you, the question was slight, asked slightly differently in 2010. Um, uh, we uh, asked people about free trade agreements and whether they would lead to job creation or job destruction. And this time we asked just about trade. Um, but uh, it didn't seem to, in most cases, affect people's answers. And even though there's a slight increase in the percentage of Americans who say trade increases jobs, um, the fact that only one in five Americans think trade increases jobs is not much to write home about. Um, so I wouldn't make too much of that. Um, uh, obviously, this has implications for the trade negotiations, the major trade negotiations, and precedent trade negotiations that are now going on. Uh, if you compare the results in the uh, TTIP countries that we uh, surveyed, as you can see, the Americans are right down there with the Italians in terms of being the most skeptical on a number of measures. Um, what I find interesting, however, is the German reaction to foreign investment. Basically, uh, the Germans are the least likely to say that a foreigner buying a German company is a good thing among any of the TTIP uh, uh, countries that we surveyed. And while they support greenfield investment, uh, next to the Italians, they have the least support uh, for that issue. So clearly, there is a problem in Germany with foreign investment. For those of you who followed the debate in Germany, you know there was a huge fight about lo foreign locusts coming in, i.e. American hedge funds coming in at one point. And um, this may even be part of an explanation of why the investor state dispute resolution mechanism has become such a big issue in Germany. Uh, that it really what we're, we're getting is not an understanding of this arcane aspect of trade agreements, but rather just a reticence about, about foreign investment in, in general. Uh, again, we can't prove that from this survey, but I think it is interesting that you get both of those problems in, in Germany. Uh, in the TPP countries, I think what is interesting is that it's the US and Japan who on most of these categories are at the bottom of uh, the support for various aspects of trade and foreign investment, uh, with particular problems in Japan. Only 15% only think trade creates jobs. Only 17% think foreign m and is, um, uh, is a good thing. Um, which it does, to my mind, raise the issue of those of us who follow trade negotiations as journalists or policy people, are thinking about the special interests and what are their, uh, op, what's their opposition and how do you overcome that opposition or mollify it or, or satisfy it. And obviously in a negotiating setting, that's what you have to worry about. But even if that's done, you have this broader issue with the public, which is they aren't sold on the idea that this is gonna be better for them on a range of measures. Uh, so I do think there are some, uh, uh, challenging um, uh, uh, kind of public relations and, and public opinion issues to, 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 to uh, address. All of this data is available on the website. All of it is uh, um, free. It's searchable. Uh, certainly, if those of you who are doing research uh, need further breakdowns, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and um, uh, I look forward to your comments and, and questions. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to I want to thank Bruce Stokes from Pew uh, for having invited me and for Peterson for hosting this event. Um, you know, I'm I'm coming from the ILO. Bruce began his talk by saying that um, it's not unusual that uh, people can, at the one and the same time, hold mutually contradictory opinions, which made me think that he too worked at the ILO. <laughs> No, um, I, I begin with two um, kind of name-dropping anecdotes that, uh, in, in my brief um, comment on this paper, 
First is Gregory Mankiw, do you remember him, a Harvard economist who was once the head of the Council of Economic Advisors. And uh, this was in a period uh, a decade ago or so when there was a huge uproar over outsourcing of American jobs, uh, a political hot potato. But uh, Mankiw answered as the economist that he is, a very competent one, and said, well, I'm sorry, every dollar of American investment that leaves this shore brings back $1.33. So we're wealthier for all this. And you'll probably recall that the week thereafter he lost his job as chief of economic advisor. Um, the, the, the fact is, is that the hard economics of the matter are sometimes difficult to square with the po politics of it. And my second name dropping event is um, Joseph Stiglitz. I heard him last week at the Global Economic Symposium, uh, and he made the following point. Let's just assume he's got his facts right. I don't know the facts. But he said this, 75 to 80% of Americans want to see an increase in the minimum wage. Right? And he said the fact of the matter is it will never happen because Congress is against it. So he used that uh, to show the difference between opinion opinions that we might overwhelmingly share, and the policy significance of it. Now, in, in my brief remarks, and I'll begin right now, we won't have time for them, uh, I just, to, 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 to say that I believe that there is an instance in which the findings of the Pew uh, survey uh, are and have been leading to policy significance in the world, and I'll get to that. Uh, now, what interests me first of all, um, I, and I, uh, Bruce, I dumb down your elaborate tables into s silly little Excel things here. But you know, basically, we're pretty much even when uh, when we look over time as to whether trade is good for us or not. Um, by even, I mean you know, a, a slight majority say um, that trade is uh, in fact uh, going for the worse over time. Uh, that's a big number. You know, uh, uh, by the way, I only use the countries for which there are data back to 2002 from Pew on this. And the other half says, no, things are getting a little bit better. But if half the countries in this survey say that uh, trade is not good for us or getting worse for us since 2002, then this is worrisome. Uh, it begs uh, a you know, number of hypothetical questions. OK, well, these years also cover the Great Recession. Did we change our minds about trade in the Great Recession? Um, they might also uh, have to do with the hitherto increase in trade that is putting pressure on labor markets, and that's my business, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, in any case, it is worrisome that the general support uh, for trade is overwhelmingly positive, you know, but, but, but lessening in, in, in a time series sense of it. The, um, I just mentioned that. The, the, other, uh, the other dumbed down uh, results of the Pew survey that I put here uh, was this notion of whether trade creates more jobs than it costs. And I, I find this to be a, a very, very interesting slide. And uh, indeed, I'm going to repeat what, um, what uh, Bruce has already mentioned about this. You know, who are these guys, the, uh, the red bar who thinks that uh, trade is not so good for us? Well, uh, the same countries that Bruce mentioned more than once, these countries. Um, I had a wonderful time figuring out what uh, Colombia was doing up there. I have no idea what's going there on there, but maybe somebody does. Um, but my, my, my take on this is the following. And by the way, uh, th this is a rich uh, harvest of data uh, without any takes you know, in its presentation. That's for us to do. You know, we can have, and construct all sorts of hypotheses. So let me, let me hypothesize on one thing here. I believe... Um, that these wealthy countries, maybe there's lots going on there, but there's also, um, I think, import paranoia going on. In other words, we've got some good, uh, you know, very successful export firms in, in, in any of these countries, certainly. But imports um, are worrisome uh, to people at large. And um, they're worrisome because of, and this is my hypothesis, the direction uh, from which the imports are coming. All right? So, I mean, I would argue, let me put it in oversimplification, Simplified terms, I would argue that maybe the USA is not terribly concerned about importing French champagne or something like that. But I think it is concerned about imports coming from China and other developing countries, which 10 or 15 years ago we said did not matter. Right? But today, 
increasingly we're saying does matter. Uh, developing country imports are le uh, less expensive. They do erode a domestic ma manufacturing base that tries to compete in, in those very same industries but are no longer competitive. Right? So my take on this is that economic restructuring uh, is what's really, really important when we look at this. By the way, let me simply say that um, we have done joint work at the ILO with the WTO uh, in our research uh, series, which is, uh, this might not thrill you very much, but believe me, this is a big deal because ILO and World Trade Organization don't work together. ILO is not even an observer at the WTO. But our research departments do work together. And we've published two volumes out of this, and basically we have the ILO, which is not surprising for the ILO, but the WTO also saying that not all trade is good, right? that there's a downside, that even in successfully globalizing countries, there's a J-curve effect with wages. Uh, in other words, wages decline before they increase in the most successful uh, countries. So. Um, that, that, the, the, you know, that's my thesis on this. I can't prove it, so I'm just uh, you know, putting it out there as a, pl as a, plausible, um, a plausible statement. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not putting up bar charts here, and I'm almost done anyway, uh, but the, 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 the notion that wages are affected by trade um, is, is an important finding of, in, in the, uh, of the perceptions in this report. And I'll tell you why I think that's the case. Um, it's, the, it's the case because uh, Wages have been stagnant, as Bruce uh, uh, Ackery pointed out in the United States. They've also been stagnant in other countries of the world. I'm, I'm coming from France, by the way, and you want to see stagnation, visit us. The, uh, the point is, is that wages have not been very successful in the globalizing economy, uh, with, with, with exceptions. First of all, globally, wages have increased in real terms you know, over time. Uh, where have they increased the most? Well, in those successfully globalizing, developing countries, you know, that's where wage rises have gone up uh, uh, remarkably. Real wages in China, uh, the, in the export uh, regions of the country, have increased seven to eight fold over the past 20 years. Right? So, I mean, there's no wage problem in, in developing trading countries. Uh, that's simply a phenomenon of, uh, of the advanced world. And I think one reason here is, once again, the direction of trade. Where is trade coming from? that could put downward pressure on, uh, on domestic wages in advanced countries. Now, um, the, 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 I, I began by saying, look, at what I really want to say is that uh, are these just opinions and perceptions that have nothing to do with reality? Right? And uh, you know, I, I, I cited uh, Stiglitz saying, well, Americans believe this, but government's not going to do a thing about it. Here's where I'd like to uh, maybe disagree just a tiny bit and to say what we're, uh, what we're thinking about. Um, what we see uh, in this work, we have a trade, uh, a trade unit at the ILO. Uh, it's recently published this publication, Labor Provisions and Bilateral Trade Agreements. And I guess you know, there's, the points that I want to make are, are really very simple with this one. Uh, there's been a huge growth in them. Now, certainly it's plausible that one of the reasons for huge growth in the prol proliferation of trade agreements uh, is the fact that people are holding these opinions that are becoming more dubious about the benefits of trade. And so what we want to see happen from an ILO perspective, certainly, is that labor clauses persist in, uh, in, in these trade agreements that guarantee basic worker rights. <laughs> One thing about the Pew results, uh, and they're fascinating, is that they ask people about what do you think the, uh, the, um, you know, the effect is on jobs. Uh, and that's a statement saying, what do you think the quantitative effect of employment creation is from trade? We worry about that question too, but we worry about a heck of a lot more. And we've had this, I, in fact, I have my, uh, my colleague uh, from the Washington office here, and we were talking earlier today um, well, what do we think about the nature of the status of employment in countries? Beyond the number of jobs, beyond wages, what else is happening in the labor market? And what is happening in the labor market is insecurity, rising insecurity of contracts, growing number of contingent contracts, shaky paid employment, 
Paid employment is very important for us at the ILO because it's usually associated with social protection. And when you don't have a paid job, then you probably have less access to social protection and you become more insecure. So the, the empirical question that I would ask if I cannot answer, does trade have anything to do with this? Right? And if that's the perception of people, then it's no surprise that we've seen this uh, huge increase in the number of uh, bilateral uh, trade agreements using labor clauses to protect worker rights. Okay, so uh, it's you know it's it, it's basically, from my point of view, and this is my last slide, uh, a question of uh, you know what do we do as governments to respond to trade? Trade is not some sort of natural force like a hurricane, for goodness sake. We have to control it. We have to control it by beefing up, in particular, the institutions by which people adjust to trade. Right? And with greater trade, we have to adjust more frequently. I believe Bruce also made this point. And therefore, we need better institutions to do it. Right? And we see this, um, I think, uh, in many countries of the world, particularly those uh, that have very weak institutions, such as a, a virtual absence of trade unions to protect workers. Uh, as well as other things such as labor market intermediation. You know, you lose your job, then what? Is it easy to get another one? Is there any help to get another one? So that's, that's my take on your, on your presentation and on the work that the Pew has done. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to Fred Bergsten and Bruce Stokes and to Adam in, in his absence. And uh, it's a great pleasure to share the discussant role with both Duncan Campbell and Susan Schwab. Uh, so this study is both interesting and useful. It's really great to have the cross-country results and a little bit of the cross-time results. And um, I want to focus in on the US results, not too surprisingly, which are pretty striking as Bruce noted. Uh, striking in the sense of uh, the U.S. being an outlier, certainly relative to de developing and emerging nations, but even relative to other advanced nations, that you see results that are pretty striking. Um, those two important questions, trade creates jobs or trade raises wages. The U.S. is at 20 percent in terms of creating jobs, as, as um, Bruce pointed out. Other advanced countries at 44 percent, emerging 52 and developing at 66. And even more striking on trade raises wages, 17% for the United States, 28% uh, for advanced, 45% for the emerging, and 55% for developing countries. So this is uh, a really interesting and extraordinary result. And of course, you see the differences, as in Bruce's presentation, also within the United States, by age, by gender, by region, by education, and by income, and less so uh, by party identification, but still some, some interesting results there. And I would just make a side note on the party identification. This is a result that we've seen in a lot of past polling in the United States on globalization. And I think it, it is something, certainly in Washington, we know that the voting records of Republicans and Democrats in Congress are starkly different in terms of the, the likelihood that they will vote for a given free trade agreement. And yet, if you look at the underlying constituencies, Republicans, if anything, are more skeptical than Democrats on trade issues. And I think that's an interesting uh, puzzle that be, um, some political scientists can investigate more, more thoroughly. But I guess the question is, is this surprising? And what, should, what, should we, what lessons should we take from it? And I would say on the front end, as, as Bruce pointed out, not terribly surprising if you look at a couple of things. One is certainly if you take these results in the context of the U.S. economy and labor market today, which is strikingly bad for working people. Uh, you have a long time wage stagnation and growing inequality. You have relatively high unemployment for the fact that we're five years beyond the recovery from the, the Great Recession. Um, you have, and, and if you look at the underlying economic theory Bruce mentioned briefly, but certainly the Stolper Samuelson result, which a lot of nerdy economists in the room, but the basic finding of, of 
uh, mainstream economic trade theory is that there will be a distributional impact from so-called freer trade uh, within the workforce. And in a country like the United States, the prediction is that less skilled workers uh, will be hurt by increased trade, by more openness, whether it's more foreign investment or, or more trade follow, um, um, more tr lower trade barriers. And high-skilled workers and owners of capital will be helped. And so you, you can hear that, and it doesn't mean that much, until you look at the underlying figures and you see that almost two-thirds of the American workforce does not have a college degree. And therefore, the prediction of mainstream economic theory is that two-thirds of the American workforce will be hurt by freer trade. And therefore, there's no paradox at all. There's, you know, why is it that, that it's a hard sell to tell American workers, we're going to put you into more direct competition with similar workers in much poorer countries where their basic human rights are not respected, many countries that are not democracies, and, we ex and, and the likely outcome is that you will um, see your wages either decline or at least stagnate, certainly on a nominal level. Why should that be a surprise that trade is not popular in the United States of America? And even beyond that, of course, um, and, and we all know that the reason trade economists would say free trade is good for everybody is that they are taking another leap, and it's a fairly large leap, which is to say that there are benefits for every economy from lowering trade barriers, and it would be possible to redistribute the benefits from the winners to the losers so that, in fact, every individual benefited. But we don't do that. We don't even talk about doing that. Uh, that's, that would involve you know, a, a, a pretty intrusive taxation system to tax away most of the benefits from the winners and hand them over to the losers. We have a policy. Uh, trade adjustment assistance, which is about helping workers who have lost their jobs because of uh, trade displacement to retrain, get a little bit of extended unemployment insurance, and hopefully uh, be helped getting a new job. That's not what economists are talking about when they talk about redistributing from the winners to the losers. Just to give you one example, if you were for, if there, a company, for example, were to gain $10 million from NAFTA and a bunch of steel workers lost $20,000 a year, this, if, if we did what economists theorize about, we would take, let's say, all but one dollar from the company, $9,999,000, and we would give each of the steel workers the difference between what they were earning before and what they're earning under the new system. We don't do that. We don't talk about doing that. It's never contemplated. And in fact, and this is, I think, the most important point, almost every other economic, domestic economic policy that we've put in place over the last couple of decades has exacerbated inequality, not mitigated it. So why would this be surprising that uh, we've lost these jobs We've had erosion of wages for the vast majority of American workers, and it's come during a period when we've had a lot of trade opening, trade agreements, high-profile debates and discussions. Uh, and just one last number on this, and Bruce alluded to it, but I think it's pretty striking if you look at the median full-time equivalent male worker in the United States of America. He learn, earns less in 2013 than he did in 1975. So you've had an extraordinary couple of decades with a lot of globalization, a lot of technological innovation, a lot of economic growth, a lot of productivity growth, and yet your median worker is not uh, benefiting from it. So what needs to be done? And there's always, uh, I've been in, in D.C. a long time doing trade policy, and there's usually two ways that we answer this question. And I'm, I remember back in the early 1990s, I think, I don't know why, I was invited to be part of a virtual trade tour with Bill Daly, who was uh, Commerce Secretary or the Economic, about NAFTA and about how great it was. And the idea was we're going to go around the country, we're going to talk to people, we're going to talk to workers, and we're going to educate them better about how great trade is. So I would call this the shout louder policy. Like, if Americans are just too dumb to understand that trade is in fact good for them, why don't we just tell them over and over again, it really is good for you, and if we shout louder, maybe they'll finally get it through their thick heads. Or 
we can think about changing the policies. And we should think about what it is we need to do. And there's two fronts on which we need to do it. One is in the trade policies themselves. Have we really designed the policies in a way that average working people in advanced economies as well as in developing economies, because trade has to work for workers all over the world. It can't be about workers in one country benefiting at the expense of workers in another country. But have we really done enough? And um, Duncan talked about the proliferation of labor provisions, which is a great thing, and it's something Susan has worked on and supported, and that I have certainly spent a lot of the last 20 years working on. And we have more trade chapters, and they, they have gotten progressively stronger over the last couple of decades, but they are not a panacea. They are not, in and of themselves, negotiating a labor chapter in a trade agreement really is just a very small first step. We have to figure out how to do a better job putting resources into enforcing and investigating and supporting countries that want to do a better job enforcing their labor laws and making sure that their labor laws are compliant with the international uh, labor rights. So, I think it's a good start that we've been pressing for labor and environment chapters and trade agreements, but we shouldn't, nobody should think that that work is done. That work has just begun and it needs to go a lot further. And then secondly, in terms of domestic policies, I think one thing that's interesting is if you look at the results, you, see, you don't see Germany uh, up there with the trade skeptics. You see the US, France, Italy, Japan, and there is, as, as uh, was pointed out in the study, a, a, a um, a divergence between low growth economies and high growth economies, with the high growth economies being much more likely to be positive about trade. That all makes sense. I mean, that is very intuitive, that a country that's successful, people are going to give a lot more leeway to. A country that is not doing so well, that is not having the rapid growth, that is not creating good jobs, it doesn't have decent wages, has too much inequality, there's going to be a lot more skepticism. So I think if we think about taxation, we think about the social safety net, retraining, education, and skills development as well as transition within the labor force, um, these are policies that the United States is not very good at. Some of the European economies are much better, certainly Germany, some of the Nordic countries, devote an enormous amount of resources to smoothing transitions for workers as they move from one field to another or one job to another. And we leave workers really uh, very much naked in, the, in terms of labor market transitions. And then we wonder why they're resistant to change and why they um, haven't been more supportive. And certainly at the macro level, uh, the choices between inflation and unemployment are important countries that, uh, that make sure they're using macro policies to support uh, economic growth and a uh, stronger labor market would be ones that would find more, um, more support. So let's take these results seriously. And it, I think what's particularly interesting is within the context of these trade agreements that we're negotiating now, it is really interesting to have the insight into how uh, the populations of the different countries see some of the different elements, and that's something that I think should help all of us at the negotiating table. So trade is good, everybody thinks so, but we need to do it better, and we need a broader set of domestic economic policies to support decent wages and good conditions and worker rights uh, for the average worker. Thank you so much. I look forward to the questions and to Susan's presentation. So many thanks for the invitation to be here today. Wonderful to be back at the Peterson Institute. Thank you, Fred. Bruce, great to be here. Uh, Duncan Campbell, really enjoyed your, your comments. And Thea, you, you are so rational and intellectual, and I'm, I'm finding myself in a position where I, I think I'm just going to take a somewhat contrarian to everybody's view opening set of remarks here. Um, Polling data, love polling data. Very interesting set of, of uh, uh, data that you, you, you brought to our attention. Um, and I'm gonna just offer some, some thoughts, um, some observations, commentary, some of it may be, be predictable given my pro-trade persuasion um, uh, and my perspective. Let me start with the following. Um, one, 
I don't think U.S. attitudes are as negative as characterized by the slides or by your characterization of the slides. Um, and the polling results perhaps aren't quite as ominous uh, or the potential impact suggested by the polling results may not be quite as ominous. Now recognize you're talking to a recovering trade negotiator and if you weren't an optimist in that business, you would slit your wrists. So again, let's, let's just, I, you know, admitting that, that uh, perspective here. Now, in a way, one shouldn't be surprised, certainly the U.S. results are as iffy as they are, given the fact that the vast majority of messages that the American people hear about trade from their politicians and from the media are negative. Um, they're negative because the negative visuals of the trade story are so much more compelling and interesting than the positive visuals of the trade story. The locked gate of the factory in the Midwest is so much more interesting than the new factory in the right to work state that might have opened in the Southeast or in the West, or the robotics or technological enhancements or the um, output enhancement numbers as distinct from the employment decrease numbers in manufacturing that we have in fact seen, and whether or not any of that has to do with trade or trade agreements. And I'm, I'm gonna come back to the, the causality versus correlation questions that we all wrestle with, obviously, and that, and that economists wrestle with, and that the average American or emerging economy citizen who is polled or developing economy citizen who is polled should not be expected to be grappling with at any given point in time. Um, it's so much easier for a politician to be talking about a factory that has been exported to Mexico or to China uh, than to note, for example, when we had our big debate about about call centers that in fact, when we all signed up for the do not call list, that call centers, two thirds of them just disappeared. They disappeared because we didn't wanna get calls during dinner, as a for example. And politicians do make a difference, uh, and political messages make a difference, and the media makes a difference, and, and I would draw your attention, was, was the survey, was your, were your slides given out? Okay. All right, well, I, I would just as, you know, exhibit one, exhibit A, page um, eight of your, of your slides. The, the timeline, you're absolutely right. It is remarkable how consistent American public opinion has been over time. But if you take a look at 2008, I'm not sure when the uh, polling was in the field. Uh, it was before the recession but it was right smack during the middle of the Democratic primary process when candidate Clinton and candidate Obama were racing to the bottom in their commentary about how utterly awful trade was for the United States. And I would argue that the 25 some point swing uh, drop in public opinion over trade was not unrelated to that, and guess what? It's kind of sort of come back in spite of the fact that it was beaten to death by our politicians at that point in time. A um, couple of things that jumped out at me, and, and Bruce highlighted them, so I'm not going to spend any time on them. Um, uh, the uh, the um, uh, absence of, of partisanship in trade, uh, opinions in contrast to the growing, dramatically growing partisanship in trade votes on Capitol Hill. Come back, I'll come back to that at the end. Um, we do know that there's a difference between how you ask questions, you know, there's gonna be an impact in terms of how you ask questions. One of the things that I would love to, to see is if you got a different question, got a different answer in your, um, does trade lower prices if you ask the question, does competition lower prices? 
because uh, I suspect you'd get a rather different you'd get a rather different question. And I think you're right. Um, a lot of foreign-made products are more expensive on the shelves in particularly developing countries. If you think of foreign-made products as luxury goods, you're going to think they're expensive. If you think they are foreign baby foreign branded baby foods um, in the Chinese market, they're more expensive. Uh, you're right, uh, but you know, does competition does competition lower prices? I think you'd probably get a different answer. Um, the reasons for optimism, there's some interesting reasons for optimism there. The demographics alone uh, in the US, I mean, optimism from my perspective, obviously. Um, I'm Susan-centric in this commentary, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the demographics, very, very interesting. Um, but I would like to, and, and the other thing that's quite interesting is in view of the um, incredible pressures and in view of some of the negative spin there, the number of Democrats and Republicans who have been willing to vote yes on trade agreements all these years. So let me, let me um, close and so that we can get into a more of a discussion uh, phase here with a suggested disaggregation of questions that we ought to contemplate, not just for the US, teeing off of this really interesting, really, really useful poll, but also for other countries, uh, other countries considered here. And, and, and so let's start with the following. And these are disaggregation, this is disaggregation for the purpose of, of thinking about attitudes about trade and their relationship to trade politics and then the relationship to trade policy, because those really are the things we're talking about here. One, what is the actual impact of international trade on the commercial activities and the lives of citizens in these countries? Um, two, uh, what is the perception, or what are the perceptions of that reality in these individual countries, and, and, and you know, how is that captured in, in polls versus the reality itself? Uh, three, how does that translate into voting behavior on the part of citizens in those countries if in fact they are enfranchised, if in fact they can vote, or in countries, in autocratic societies, you know, how does it translate into other ways for citizens to influence their governments? And finally, four, uh, what else might be influencing positions being taken by elites, policymakers, in our case, members of Congress, the president? So, for example, in the U.S., you don't have to go too far when you're looking at this data. Uh, you think, one, a lot of the things that Thea was talking about um, and that Duncan was talking about, there's a limited relationship between trade and some of the employment and economic impact, uh, inequality, uh, wage issues, inequity issues that we're grappling with in this country, limited relationships. We look at the polling data. Um, most of the American people seem to have figured that out. If you look at other voting data, you discover that very few Americans actually cast their votes on the basis of trade. Uh, and yet you have a lot of Democrats voting no on trade agreements since the early 1980s. Why is that? You immediately find yourself having conversations about gerrymandered trade districts and key votes. And if you take a look at the key votes that say the US Chamber does, go to 2011 for example, US Chamber's key votes versus the AFL-CIO's key votes, you discover they key voted a lot of the same trade votes and key voted them very differently. So it's, these are disaggregated questions, um, but they make for rather interesting conversations about these issues. But starting with the polling data um, and being able to uh, parse it this way makes it an awful lot more fun and interesting. So thank you very much.
to sit next to me. Okay, very rich uh, discussions, lots of issues on the table. Um, I'm going to arbitrarily say that even though we had promised to end at 1.30, uh, we'll go for 15 to 20 minutes to permit discussion of all this material. It'll only scratch the surface, but at least we'll get a chance to, uh, to begin to discuss. So I want to go straight to the floor, ask for questions, comments. Uh, please go to either the standing mic in the back or get the traveling mic here. Identify yourself and fire away. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Irving Williamson, U.S. International Trade Commission. And what, one of the questions when Bruce was presenting, I was wondering, what does he say? Is international trade good for our country, or is it abstract? Duncan did mention for us. And so let me just think about, has there been any sort of in-depth research or questioning about to find out whether, how much do people understand? Or what would they think if you said trade is good if we had a more equitable distribution of income in the U.S. or some, so, so many of the policies that mm -hmm. Thea did that might mitigate the impacts of trade agreements. So I was just wondering, how well does the American public understand that some of the factors or what views do they have of it and how might that affect their view of trade if they thought other things were happening to, um, I think, make it more beneficial or more, have the benefits more equitably distributed? Bruce, you want to respond? To I, I, I don't know of, of uh, any surveys that have attempted to do that. I can imagine that maybe some messaging surveys that are done in a political context might do that uh, because uh, you'd be testing out messages uh, that the candidate might want to use. I think that that'd be a more likely source for that kind of data than uh, a more general public opinion survey. Ernie? Uh, one question and uh, one suggestion. My question is whether this critical question of uh, does trade create jobs, whether it should not be related to whether the countries have a trade surplus or a trade deficit, and particularly a growing surplus or deficit. Uh, and um, Manufacturers Alliance these days, particularly manufacturing, it's two-thirds of global trade is where all the jobs are, unlike petroleum or coffee or iron ore. Uh, and I didn't find that uh, too clearly in your presentation, but on, on page nine, for example, uh, with large and grow uh, well large and growing deficits, the U.S. of course the last five years, mm -hmm. uh, we're way down at 15 percent, and Italy is 13 percent, and with the largest and growing surpluses, you've got Germany at 43 percent, and China at 67 percent thinks it creates jobs, which is pretty. Uh, so, so that brings me also to, my, uh, to, the, to the suggestion, uh, Bruce in particular, uh, you didn't mention China at all in your presentation, uh, and yet China is you know, number one exporter by far, biggest, and, and, the, and what is the U.S.-China relationship on these seven questions? Because it really doesn't fit advanced or emerging. China is the number one exporter of advanced technology industries. It's, it's a, it's certainly advanced, and we're, if anything, declining. So uh, I would think it would be very interesting to see, uh, for the seven questions, just a, a little table of where is the U.S. and where is China on these questions. Maybe you can uh, right. Um, those are really two questions, uh, Ernie. Very good ones. Um, we did try to run some correlations uh, between some of these attitudes and various objective factors to see if there was a connection. Uh, the one we put in the report was where we saw the greatest uh, correlation, which was between if, if you had uh, fairly rapid uh, wage growth in the country over the last five years, you were much more likely to think trade raised wages. Uh, and if you had slow growth, you were more likely to say that trade uh, um, uh, hurt wages. Um, uh, uh, I have, we have one of our, my, my associates here, Jill, you ran a, a series of those. I, as I recall, we did not look at the size or the growth of the trade deficit related to these. Uh, and I think, in part, my thinking, if I can reconstruct my thinking at the time, was that I'm not so sure that most people know what the trade balance of their country is. And um, whereas we did try to run it against other objective measures, what percentage of the economy is actually traded um, uh, to see if there was any correlation there. And, and for the most part, 
there weren't a lot of statistically significant measures other than the wage relationship. We, I mean, obviously there are other things that could be done that we may not have thought of. In terms of China, one of the reasons I didn't mention China is, frankly, the Chinese data is pretty boring. I mean, basically they think trade creates jobs, they think it raises wages. Why wouldn't they think that? I mean, wages in, in China overall have risen, I think, 10% a year for, for, for every year for the last 10 years. Exports have risen 15% a year for every year for the last 10 years. Um, of course, uh, their experience has been that this is very, very good for them, as, it, as the Vietnamese are in the same, same position. Um, the one thing that did uh, stand out from the Chinese data was they were very, very low in their support for even greenfield investment. They're very leery of foreigners coming in as well, uh, which is a, you know, an issue, it seems to me, uh, going, going forward. Um, in terms of the uh, US-China relationship, the purpose of this really wasn't to look at that. We did, a couple of years ago, do uh, a broad survey of the American public and their attitudes towards China. And what, what stuck out in that survey was we asked the public what they thought the biggest problems were uh, or issues with China, and then we asked elites. We asked a, series, a, a pool of China experts in the United States uh, what they thought. And what was interesting is that the American public said the biggest problems with issues with China are the trade deficit, the fact that the Chinese hold a lot of our debt, and the export of jobs to China. And none of the elites thought that was a problem. So there's, we have a problem internally on China between the China experts and, and, the, and, the, and the general uh, public. The, the one, the, Ernie, the one country that deviates from your correlation uh, between imbalances and attitudes is Japan. Right. Uh, Bruce showed Japan as one of the most skeptical countries, but it's the world's largest creditor country. It's had the largest accumulation of trade surpluses over time. Has been some de decline recently with its energy imports, but in terms of your manufacturers, it's still a big surplus country. So that is one outlier on your own criterion. Right. Scott. Yes, uh, Scott Miller, CSIS. Question for Bruce on your database. First of all, mm -hmm. fascinating study. I appreciate you do presenting this data. Um, a question about cities. Uh, at a previous presentation here at Peterson uh, by Richard Baldwin on supply chains, or value chains, mm -hmm. Baldwin made the comment that cities are the factories of the 21st century. And most uh, sort of engagement with the world happens in cities around the world. So my question is, can you, can you ask your database these questions and, and, dis and separate out respondents from cities versus respondents from the rest of the country? Uh, that's a good question. I, we've tried that in past surveys. I didn't try it with this one because we couldn't do that uh, in enough countries to make it uh, relevant, but I'll go back and look at it. I mean, actually, I think at some point we should do an urban survey where we would look at the world's cities and, and try to see what, how those attitudes compare with the overall country. Um, Bruce, do you know, just back of the envelope, whether most of your surveying took place in cities? N no, no, it, it, in, in all of these countries, it's, it's spread across the entire country. It's both demographically reflects the demographic makeup of the country, so if the country's 51% female, 51% of, uh, of the uh, sample is, is female, but also in terms of rural urban, that's been very difficult. Some of our earlier surveys was very hard to do. We didn't accomplish that in places like uh, Brazil or China or India. We now, we now are able to do that. It's one of the reasons it's, these are so frightfully expensive. Um, we are able to, I know in the U.S., look at rural versus urban. And, and to bear out your point, I mean, urban people are more supportive, less critical, less wary of trade, less skeptical uh, than rural people. Um, and, but that's also correlated with probably less education, maybe less income. I mean, there's a number of things driving that. Let me come to a question up in front here, uh, Peter, in the front, uh, at the front table. Thank you, Peter Allgaier with the Coalition of Service Industries. Obviously, in any polling, what people understand by the words that you're using in the polling is critical, and yet often you don't really know what they're thinking of mm -hmm. in terms of interpreting those words. The word I'm thinking of is trade. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that most people, when you ask them, is trade good, they're thinking, certainly in the United States, they're thinking trade in automobiles, in clothing, in manufacturing, maybe a bit in agriculture. They're not thinking about trade in services. Mm 
And what we find when we talk to people about trade and services is they look at us and say, how do you trade a service? <laughs> what kind of service yeah. do you trade? And of course, this actually is one of the most, maybe the most dynamic area of our economy and it's increasingly going to be an economy of services. So I, I just make that as an observation in terms of when you're talking to people, what do they understand about what our economy looks like these days? And are they reflecting on an economy that is decades out of, out of um, sync with reality? No. Let, let me ask Bruce to comment, and then Thea, you might want to comment on that too, because I think it's germane to the things you were saying. Well, I think it's a very good question. And look, it is one of the limitations of survey. Re survey research is an art, not a science. Now we have a PhD in political science here who's a survey expert who might disagree with me. But the, but the point is, it is um, we have to understand the limitations here. We, we don't know what people hear when you ask them a question. And how, what they hear when you ask them about trade is a perfect example. Do they hear imports or exports? And my intuition tells me, although I can't prove this, is it depends on the country. As Duncan said, when, when people hear about trade with France, they're thinking about high-valued things that we buy. And they hear about trade with China, they're, they're, they're thinking about T-shirts and, and uh, textiles and shoes and things that might throw Americans out of work. Uh, I also think it depends. We know from surveys we've done, we ask people, who would you like to increase trade with? And Americans say, well, we don't want to increase trade with China. Mm. My guess is, again, I can't prove this, that people are hearing imports. Mm. Trade means imports from China. We don't want to do that. Whereas with some other countries, Germany, for oh, it's export. We'd like to sell the Germans more. So I do think you're, you're absolutely right. But again, it's, it's one of those limitations. You'd almost have to do focus groups, try to tease out. from And on your question of services, for, I think you're undoubtedly correct. Um, um, in my hometown, the largest employer used to be the steel mill, now it's the hospital. I mean, that's, that's a sign of the shift from a manufacturing economy to a services economy. I will bet you any money, the people in that town, nobody in that town knows that. Hmm. They just don't understand it. Because, you know, a job is bending steel with your bare hands. A job is not, you know, working in a hospital. That's, that's something, you know, ancillary. Thea? Yeah, I, I think your question is, is really important because the word trade is so vague. But I think one, a couple of things that are interesting from this, this survey is one is the difference between 2010 and 2014. And I think even the phrasing the trade agreements versus trade, you saw a much more negative um, set of results there. But I think it also goes back to Ernie's question about, you know, do you think imports or exports? I think that might make a difference if you are a country that runs big chronic trade deficits or big chronic trade surpluses. In other words, it's sort of a, a shorthand for do you see your country as being successful in the global economy or, or unsuccessful? And um, that certainly does have some impact. But I think, um, you know, and in terms of trade and services, I, it's absolutely true that most Americans don't uh, immediately think about trade and services. Probably they don't know that we have a trade surplus in services and a big trade deficit in in goods, but it's also true a couple of years ago as more services became tradable, there became more insecurity around some of those issues around the offshoring and the outsourcing of things that had been done in the United States, whether it's uh, you know, reading x-rays or call centers or, or other things. And so you know, I, I, it probably takes a little while for public opinion to catch up to what the economy actually looks like. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't say that there is I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute too much of it to ignorance. I think, you know, certainly whether people think um, that a, a job in manufacturing is a good job versus a job at retail, um, there is, there's data on that, that the job in manufacturing, partly because those jobs tended to be more unionized, um, tend to pay more and have more benefits than a lot of the um, sort of low-paying, entry-level jobs not all of them, of course, but a lot of the ones that, that most Americans transition to if they lose their good job in the manufacturing sector, a job that maybe their parents and their grandparents held before them. So these kinds of changes are, are ones that you know, people are experiencing real time, and they're, um, they're not wrong about the, the overall trends. Question in the back. Thank you. Uh, Dan Kim from Keita. 
Um, I recall reading a polling from Pew earlier this year uh, asking the American public how much they actually care about trade policy um, as, par as compared to other trade, you know, uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. And either came in very last or it's second next to very last mm -hmm. um, as to how much trade policy actually matters to the American public. Um, so my question would be, do you get this similar sense in other countries that you, uh, that you polled here? I asked particularly because for a lot of the questions that you asked, there was a large percentage of people who said it doesn't even make a difference, mm -hmm. which you said could be interpreted as don't care or don't know. And if that's similar to other countries, could it, is it possible that they really don't care or they don't know, it doesn't really make a difference? And if I may just ask a quick question to the uh, recovering trade negotiator, uh, <laughs> Ambassador Schwab, how do, are you aware when you're in the negotiating room of these public opinions in your own country and those other countries, and how does that affect the negotiating itself? If I could just get a perspective from you, thank you. Well, uh, Sue, Sue mentioned this as well, that, that Americans do not rank trade as a very important priority. Um, I like to joke that I think there are more Americans who believe in space aliens than believe trade's a priority. Um, uh, it comes in often around 3%, so it's very low in terms of people's rank order of, of major issues. Um, uh, and as a recovering trade journalist, uh, having covered uh, elections for 30 years, I, of course, wanted every election to be only about trade. And I was frustrated every election cycle because <laughs> the reality is there are very few examples where trade actually was a major issue in a political campaign uh, or, or the determining issue, really, in a political campaign. Um, I remember when Richard Gephardt won the Iowa primary uh, back in, um, I think it was 80, 88, uh, and uh, Terry McAuliffe, who is now the governor of Virginia, was his chief fundraiser. <laughs> so I called Terry up and I said, this is great. It looks like, you know, you're going to, maybe your guy's going to be president. And he said, well, the problem was we won that campaign by running an ad against Korean cars. Um, the day after the election, all our funding dried up because no New York funder wants a political, you know, guys who write checks, want to be associated with a protectionist. Uh, so uh, even where it might be an issue and might have worked, uh, it had negative knock-on effects. Um, um, you know, that said and done, I do think that there is an underlying uncertainty here in the American public, uh, which uh, politicians uh, 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 can work with. Uh, I'm reminded that one of Dukakis's uh, major uh, uh, campaign advisors said to me, he loved to have his candidate talk about trade. And I said, why? Because we, it doesn't seem to work that well. And he said, look, it's not, people don't care about trade. What they care about is they want a candidate who, can, who looks like he's standing up for the American people. And you can be tough on trade. And, and you're, I'm standing up for the American people, but I'm also compassionate. I'm worried about the victims of this, uh, of this globalization. And I'm also foresightful. I'm, I'm dealing with the future and not the past. I'm looking for how we, how we get the economy going again. So I do think that trade will remain a political concern for politicians, not because of trade per se, but because it is a way candidates can demonstrate character to the voter, or at least according to this one political advisor, that's the way he explained it to me. Sue? Um, I, you know, as a, as a negotiator, you are always conscious of the other person's political imperatives. Um, sometimes they're more uh, related to trade politics than others. If some, you know, if, if the other side has an elect, is in an election cycle, uh, that's clearly going to have an impact if trade is an issue. Um, in the negotiation of chorus, in when the beef issue flared up, um, Minister Kim came in with a photograph of a million people demonstrating in Seoul, downtown Seoul. That wasn't an accident. That wasn't an oversight. Uh, it was a useful show and tell item for the negotiation for his side. Um, uh, Senator Grassley's calls to me were useful for my side and I shared the fact that I was getting those calls. Uh, 
the EU is a very different situation, and the EU Commissioner and DG Trade and DG Agri have very different kinds of accountability, and, and I would say evolving, given the Lisbon Treaty and the new uh, EU Parliament, but very, very different kinds of a political accountability um, uh, contexts that they operate in. The Chinese negotiators also have very different accountability contexts, even though the electoral uh, uh, context is not one that they're dealing with. They have their own political accountability uh, context they're dealing with too, but you're always conscious of the other person's um, political context and political imperatives, and you're trying to figure out the extent to which trade really is an issue, because frequently it isn't. Two more questions, one here and then to the back. Sam Kelston with Washington Tariff and Trade Letter. Uh, to follow up on the low ranking of trade in the public opinion, um, statistically it seems that uh, trade matters less to the American worker. The Commerce Department just put out a report saying that 7.1 million manufacturing jobs are related to exports. In 1990 they put out a report saying 7.2 million j manufacturing jobs were related to exports. Uh, back in 90, they were saying that 19,000 jobs are related to each billion dollars of exports. Uh, now the numbers they put out are around 6,000 jobs are related to each billion dollars in exports. So how does the, the input, the labor input to trade affect the attitudes in the U.S. at least, uh, since uh, so fewer you know people seem to be, uh, not fewer, but uh, pr proportionately seem less involved in trade uh, than they used to be, because partly because there's such a larger percentage of foreign materials and components in what the U.S. exports. Bruce, and again, Thea, I'd ask I you mean, that. I the details of that I can't speak to because that's way beyond public opinion data. Um, it is interesting that younger people in the U.S. are less critical, skeptical, wary of trade than older people. And I think that makes total sense. I mean, it's people my age who, uh, you know, the two-thirds of my high school graduating class that didn't go to college and thought they could make a living living at working in the local steel mill, who are at the margin more likely to have been affected by trade than me. And um, uh, in, I would presume over time, as my generation dies off, and those people who lost their jobs in manufacturing or had friends or relatives lose their jobs in manufacturing, as, as they would have in the 40 years, uh, as they die off, those memories die off with them. And younger people who never had those jobs, or African Americans or Hispanics who, who, who were never allowed to have those jobs. Um, uh, and, we all work more and more in, in a service-related industry, some of which may not be exposed to global competition, that you might see some change in these attitudes simply because our life experiences are different. Yeah. Um, I think, of course, it's true that there are fewer jobs related to every billion dollars worth of imports or exports, uh, mostly because of productivity increases. But I think it's also important. I know economists often want to make this distinction, you know, there's technology and then there's globalization and these are separate impacts on jobs and wages. But the truth is that a lot of times they're connected to each other in the sense that one of the reasons that companies use more labor-saving technology is that they're facing global competition. And so, you know, you have these in intersecting uh, results. And if you think about most workers or most American communities, they are impacted by globalization. I think they know they're impacted by globalization in a whole bunch of different ways. You know, certainly for our members, when they go to the bargaining table, those who work in manufacturing or in offshoreable services, if they go to the bargaining table, they are told very, very directly by their bosses, you need to take a pay cut, we're going to lay off people, we're moving stuff because we can go to some other country and we will go to some other country where workers have fewer protections. We don't have to worry about environmental uh, protections, we don't have to worry about safety goggles, we don't have to worry about bath bathroom breaks, and we certainly don't have to worry about unions. So if workers face that every single day, and it's not every worker, but it's a lot of workers, um, face that kind of barrage at the bargaining table, and then they read 
the editorial page of the Washington Post or the New York Times saying trade is good, they find a, you know, this is a, one of the cognitive disconnects, is that people are having to process a lot of different kinds of information, or if they see that their community is lo has lost its tax base because the factory closed down, and so the teachers are being laid off, and the cops are being laid off, and the firefighters are being laid off. So I think we, you know, we have to think about bargaining power, we think about community impact, and you think about even the other kinds of things that even young people are exposed to about sweatshop exposés. What are the working conditions for workers who make the stuff I wear or that I eat or that I drive or that I sit on? And um, so, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a complicated question. It's not surprising that there's a lot of um, complexity within these results. But I don't think we should kid ourselves that, you know, we know the answers or that workers are no longer uh, this is no longer an issue. It may be an issue that some of them recognize and, and others don't. There, there is a, a subtle economics point underlying the uh, question you raised about the decline in number of workers per dollar of output. And Thea mentioned quite rightly that that decline is mainly because of the big improvements in productivity over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. But by definition, that increase in productivity is greater in the export sector than in the import competing sector. So you've lost more potential constituents for trade from the export side than you have on the import competing side. And therefore, to the extent that that subtly translates itself into votes or attitudes or anything else, uh, it would tend to support a declining secular trend in support of trade. I think we should do some quantification on that. Last question. Uh, hi, Bruce. Uh, my name is Cap Sharma. I have a question that's not directly related to trade, but I was wondering if the data could help me uh, predict how some of these countries are looking at labor mobility. Um, because you talk about greenfield investments, you talk about job creation, but there was no discussion about labor mobility. And a lot of countries right now are trying to address whether it should be easier for high-skilled workers to be moving from country to country as companies right. like my own become more multinational. Which is what? Tata. Tata the Tata Group based out of India, the ability for us to move people with whatever specialties around the world becomes more and more important. Mm -hmm. But we find that a lot of countries are making it difficult for high-skilled labor mobility. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, could I look at your data and almost predict, because there's a lot of countries in Europe, Canada, United States, all looking at their visa policies. Could I almost predict where these countries might go when it comes to high-skilled right. labor mobility? Thank you. It's a very good question. I, I would just as an aside, uh, and I'll send you, Cap, I, we, we did a demographic breakdown for India, and we all know that the Indians have been a bit difficult in WTO negotiations. I think that might be an understatement for, for Susan. Um, the public in India is so much more open and embracing of trade and foreign investment than its leaders. It is stunning. Um, but anyway. That's an aside. Uh, we, we, don't, we haven't asked that question. It would be a great set of questions to ask. Um, my recollection is the German Marshall Fund in its immigration survey uh, research work, but only in the U.S. and, 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 and Europe, unfortunately, um, has in the past asked about high-skilled versus low-skilled uh, immigration. Um, uh, I don't remember the results. Uh, I do remember, at least in some countries, there was no distinction drawn. Uh, and I know we have done this, I think, in one survey in the U.S. Uh, and what was disturbing, if you see it as disturbing, there was no, um, uh, there was no real distinction. Uh, people uh, had, were equally dubious about it. Okay. Many thanks to Bruce and his Pew Research Center for undertaking this work. It's enormously important and helpful. Uh, it raises as many questions probably as it answers, but that's terrific. It gives us a great new database. So many thanks in particular to Bruce and Pew. Thanks also to Duncan, Thea, Susan for adding to the conversation today. Thanks to all of you for attending. Meeting adjourned.